it hides many of the directives that are not important to get the server up and running. But oftentimes you need to launch yourself into advanced view to see those additional directives if there are performance issues or connectivity problems or things that are peculiar to your environment. Basic view again lists the key directives, the work group or realm that the server belongs to, its NetBIOS name, optional aliases, your server can appear to be a different server on the network by publishing one or more aliases, a string, the interfaces that it should bind to. So these are like your base options as it's described. But again, if we expand using advance, you'll see many more base options and many more options for the other categories. So now we see base options have, or base options has more options that we have not discussed. Bind interfaces only, NetBIOS scope, display character set, Unix character set, DOS character set. These are all additional items that work well with the default, but again, you may need to tweak depending on whether or not you have trouble. In the security section, another important section, you need to determine the mode in which your Samba server will authenticate. And here are the supported mo modes. We didn't discuss share because this is a mode you should stay away from. This is similar to assigning a password to a share, which is outdated and is not secure and not recommended. Server domain, ADS, and user are the modes you should look to use, primarily user or ADS. Whether or not passwords should be encrypted, definitely. Secure channel for the client and the server automatically. If the server requests it, the Samba server, or if the remote system requests it, whether client or server, the Samba server will attempt to accommodate. The account that's to be used for guests. Guest requests get translated to the local Linux user, nobody. And the local Linux user, nobody, has a high ID. If you grep nobody from ETC password, it has a high ID of 65,534. So if a user connects from a Samba client or Windows client or Windows server to our Samba server as guest, guest will be translated if guest support is enabled to the nobody account. In this case, nobody has 99, NFS nobody has 65,534. So the default nobody account has the 99 ID. The NFS nobody, which we looked at during the NFS section, has the high ID of 65,534. Whether or not users to be, are to be invalid or validated, so you can determine, let's say there's someone who's been terminated from the organization and you need a quick way to deny them access to your Samba server, you can set them in the invalid user list field. Users who are equivalent to admin, who get translated ultimately to root on the Linux system, a list of users who may read and write, the printer administrator, hosts that are permitted access, hosts that are denied access. If the, end, the fields are blank, then all access is allowed. If there are modules that are to be loaded to help Samba do its job. Logging options, if you want to change the variable or add to the variable, maybe percent %m doesn't suffice, maybe 50 kilobytes isn't, aren't enough. And again, when you click on help, you're propelled into a separate page which returns the explanation for the directive in a context sensitive manner. So here we see log file and it tells you how the log file works and so on. You can learn more about it. And that's for the log file entry. It just tells you that it's a path to the log file. Protocol options, printing options, cups uses raw by default so you're connecting clients which naturally default to raw will be able to send print jobs through your cups print server directly to your printer. Browse options, this has to do with how your server interacts with other Windows servers on a given subnet as well as within a given domain. Wins options, which we've described. If you want your server to be a Win server, you say yes or you select yes. If you want to indicate a remote Win server, you specify one or more IP addresses, click on help, and it's again context sensitive. You'll be propelled to Win server and it tells you how you may use this particular directive. So you can indicate Win server in a variety of ways. The name of the server colon IP address or just the IP address or even multiple IP addresses delimited using space. So again, the help is context sensitive. 
items related to event log, wind bind, such as how to map out the Windows users to local Linux IDs, etc. And for each of these groups, the advanced section opens up a bunch of direct directives that you have not seen. Now let's, in the interest of saving time, move forward and look at the share section. The share section is self-explanatory. It has basic and advanced views. When you click on the arrow in the choose share section, you see the shares that are available. Click on a share, click on choose share, and then you'll see the options that pertain to the share below. It's comment, it's path. The path is dynamic, which is why there's no entry here. Invalid, valid, admin, read, write. Whether or not it's read only, guest, whether or not guest access is okay. Well, for the home share, guest access should not be permitted. Whether or not host specific IP addresses should be allowed or denied. With no entries, it means that all users are permitted at least connectivity, but you still need credentials. Whether or not it's browsable. This is a way to hide the share altogether, not using dollar sign like you do in Windows, but using a special Samba feature which hides the share. And in the case of homes, it's hidden and it, it is automatically generated, almost like the way AutoFS makes a directory available at runtime or at request time. And again, there are advanced parameters for shares as well. And if you want to create a share, you can do so, which we'll do momentarily once we get the server up and running. In the printers area, this is the interface that you'd use to define a printer. You can create a printer and point it to a printer that's connected to the Linux box, or connect it across the network and just route it through your Samba box. There's a wizard which includes predefined tasks, as all wizards do, such as setting your server up as a domain member, a domain controller, configure a Win server, expose home directories. These are some basic wizards. There's a status section. In here, you can determine the status of the demons. As we see, the version followed by the demons and their statuses. Not running, not running, not running. And that's true. If we clicked on Start All, momentarily the, the, the Samba instances would start up and then we'd, be able, we'd attempt to connect to the Samba instance. Active connections, active shares, open files, so on and so forth. In view mode, you get a bird's eye view of the smb.conf file with the comments removed for brevity. So here are the items that are important. The work group, the string, the log file, its size, so on and so forth. And in the password section, the last tab, this is an area where you can change a user's password, such as root's password. And this is basically a front end to the SMB password file. So you can assign a password, let's say for the user root, and this simply updates the user root's password, not the user root in the Linux system. Now, it said it failed to find an entry because there are no passwords. If we navigate to ETC Samba, where we currently are, there was no SMB password file. The file is blank. It contains nothing. In fact, it was just created, which explains why it's zero bytes. So the Samba instance was unable to change the password for the user because the user doesn't exist. If we go ahead and indicate the password that we'd like to set for the user, simple ABC123, click on Add New User, and then it says below, Added User Root. Perhaps this should be bolded so it's obvious. Then return to the shell and relist the contents of the directory. We now see that SMB password is 101 bytes, and when we cat SMB password, we'll see it contains the user root, followed by the string, the NT-compatible string, which represents the user's password. And it also includes the user's ID. This is very important, by the way. ETC SMB password maps out to ETC password. Let's just note that. ETC Samba SMB password maps Windows users to ETC password. And you can tell that it does this by looking at the field immediately following the user's ID. Root followed by zero means this user is equivalent to root, followed by root's password, of course. Also notice that the secrets.tdb file, this is that tdb SAM file that we discussed briefly earlier, has been created. 
So it contains the user accounts database in a binary format, which is not visible to us. In fact, the file secrets TV, TDB will tell us that it's a database file. So again, we have one user, and if we connect from a Windows system or a remote Samba instance as this user root, we'll then be able to interact with the Samba server as root. And if you want to add another user, such as, let's say, Linux CBT, let's go ahead and find that Samba window. By all means, do so. Just go ahead and type in the user's name with a password. And by the way, the password does not have to match the Linux user's password. Simply the username and user ID. So now this user has been added. And let's take a look at the contents of SMB password. It's now 208 bytes. And we will see that there's a new user SM, in the SMB password file name, named Linux CBT with the ID 500. Now let's grab Linux CBT from ETC password just to show you that indeed ID 500 in SMB password matches ID 500 in ETC password. And it's not just a coincidence, it's done by design to ensure that when a connecting user authenticates as Linux CBT, regardless of Windows password, they are able to be translated on the Linux file system as the user Linux CBT. It's done for that sole purpose of mapping the NetBIOS user to the Linux user. And you can control it using this interface or using SMB password. So for example, let's grab student from ETC password. There we see student one. If we use SMB password with no options, it prompts us for a new password for the currently logged in user. However, run it with help and you'll see how you can add a new user to the database. So SMB password with the A option, followed by the user's name, student one. Now it prompts us, we'll set it to ABC123. And now when we cap the contents of SMB password, you'll see three users. And also, co coincidentally, student1 has the ID 501. Let's grep again student1 from ETC password just to confirm that, and there you see the user has 501. So the mappings are done purposefully. Now with that all said, we need to start the Samba server and attempt to connect. It doesn't make sense.